Yeah, we've got uh, people still joining, um, but uh, we might as well get underway. Uh, so hello, everybody. Welcome to this Figshare webinar. Today, we have a very special guest, John Tennant, who's going to, who's joining us to give his uh, views on open research. Uh, John completed his award-winning PhD at Imperial College London, where he researched evolutionary patterns of animals like crocodiles and dinosaurs. He was a communications director of Science Open for two years, but has spent the last year as an independent researcher. He's he was the founder of the Open Science MOOC, the digital publishing platform Paleo Archive, and currently works as a PLOS Paleo community editor. He spent much of his recent time challenging the business practices of the scholarly publishing industry, including formal complaints to the European Commission, working with Education International on a global campaign to democratize uh, knowledge. <laughs> uh, he is also a Shuttleworth uh, Flash grantee and has won an award for his work on peer review. As well as this, John was the lead author of the Foundations for Open Scholarship Strategy Development, is co-author for the Open Science Training Handbook, and is the executive editor for the OA journal Geoscience Communication. He has also written, written, written several kids' books on dinosaurs. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to John. Awesome. Thanks, Al. That was a very long-winded way of saying sits around all day drinking coffee, coffee and not doing much. So let me try and uh, share my screen, and then we can get started. Is that working okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. Okay, cool. So hi everyone, thanks for being here. I know it's a murky Tuesday afternoon and uh, really appreciate you all turning up for this. So I'm gonna deliver just um, a webinar which is sort of on like the current status of the open science landscape based on a presentation I gave a couple of weeks ago in, in Norway. Um, so just to start off with, like a little bit of history or like background, what you know, what way I did about it. You know, so the fact is that the vast majority of scholarly research and knowledge is currently held uh, hostage by a small number of private corporations, and the the impact of this is that this disadvantages virtually everyone on this planet, um, except those who happen to be fortunate to be in the wealthiest or most elite research institutes. Now, the, these publishers, these are commercial giants, and they are essentially ruthless racketeers that have profit margins that are at twice um, that of even you know, the big oil companies or Apple, you know, often exceeding about 35 or 40%. And the result of this privatization of knowledge is that we are not communicating research effectively, and our world is suffering as a result of this. And one of the consequences of these are what I like to call the four sort of research crises. Um, and there are four sort of big ones here. So the first is the access crisis, the fact that most people on this planet still do not have access to most research on this planet. The second is what's often called the reproducibility crisis, where most um, statistical or um, empirical research seems to fail basic reproducibility tests, and which is one of the foundational elements of rigorous research. The third is the serials crisis, which emphasizes the escalating costs of journals um, to the extent that it's increased, I think, something like 300% above the rate of inflation in the last 30 years and is virtually unaffordable to any single research institute um, in the world. And the fourth is the evaluation crisis by, by the fact that you know, the vast majority of researchers still um, are assessed based on metrics such as like the impact factor or journal brand or journal rank, as opposed to any intrinsic quality of their, of their research. Um, so where does open research or open science or open scholarship come into all of this? So I wanted to have a little uh, subtle message on this slide, but like the message is that science is not working as well as it should be. You know, often it's, um, it's slow and it's wasteful. You know, we're not taking advantage of collaboration uh, as, and tools that the web affords us. Often it's governed by commercial interests. Copyright isn't really something that's designed to protect authors anymore. We have these, these four crises, which I just mentioned, and all of this is sort of embedded in this illusion of academic freedom, where we think that we're given the choice of what we're allowed to to research and communicate, but really is out of our control um, in a lot of the cases. And one consequence of this is that there's a proliferation of what are called things like questionable research practices, such as uh, doctoring data, uh, manipulating images, or you know, uh, p-hacking or hacking, all of these things that we hear about. And the result of this in, in the bigger picture is that this sort of closed way of doing things means that people suffer. And if you put this in like a wider sort of global context and look at the UN 
sustainable development goals. There are sort of key issues here around things like affordable and clean energy, uh, solving the hunger crisis, um, taking action against the ongoing climate change and biodiversity crises, and you know, giving people things like quality education. And usually this question works better in a face-to-face -face environment, but you know, the question is, you know, do you believe that scientific research can help us to at least mitigate or solve these problems? Well, you know, the unanimous answer is usually yes, but then by um, the same sort of um, terms, we must acknowledge that by preventing access to research, then we're actually acting against meeting these goals. And sadly, this is what many in the present scholarly publishing industry are doing in exchange for our money. So, you know, not all publishers are doing this and not all actors, but the, the ones who have a lot of control and dominance of this landscape are doing this. And, you know, it's not a bug. This is actually a feature of the present system. And, you know, it's not great. Um, just for like a little analogy, you know, those of us who've ever tried to publish a paper will know sort of like what a scam the whole sort of uh, process is. You know, for each of us trying to get published in a, in a research journal is like going into a restaurant, bringing all of your own ingredients and cooking the meal yourself and then being asked for $40 for a waiter to bring it on a plate for you. And it's insane because what we end up being as researchers are at the same time the provider, the product and the consumer for the for these large megacorps. So, you know, why, why is this sort of taking off now? Why, why is this important in a modern research environment like today? Well, you know, depending on how you look at things, um, they are in some cases getting worse. What we're seeing, particularly in Europe, is the co-option of the open science space. Um, where private interests are strengthening and taking control, not just of the publishing process, but of the entire sort of research process, all the way through uh, from deciding, you know, who gets awarded grants based on which criteria to how uh, researchers and the, the products of research are assessed. And, you know, if, depending on who you speak to, again, some people will say it's already too late. You know, the, the, uh, the private corporations have taken sort of control over the open science space or we're at least running out of time. So, you know, really we have to act now as a global community to actually become coordinated and take control of the research ecosystem. Um, just to sort of bring it back to open science. So I don't think there's really any sort of unified or widely accepted definition of what open science is. So, you know, we often talk about open science as if it's a distinct entity to, to you know, good science. Now, if you wanted to actually read a uh, paper about, um, which did a systematic review on what open science is, it sadly is paywalled by Elsevier. But the conclusion which they reached was that open science is transparent and accessible knowledge that is shared and developed through collaborative networks. So this is very much based on, you know, um, practices and, and um, on, on outputs. In 2015, so a few years ago now, um, Mick Watson, he wrote an article saying, when will open science simply become science? And he, uh, he reached a conclusion that open science describes the practice of carrying out scientific research in a completely transparent manner and making the results of that research available to everyone, which is kind of similar to the previous one. But he then said, isn't that just science? And, you know, I think that the difference here is that one of them being purely process based and, you know, saying that it is an inherently different thing to just science is very bad. Whereas what Mick came up with is actually very good because, you know, he's talking about the principles of science here. And, you know, what, what the fuss here is that, to me at least, you know, I feel open science has become this pro poorly defined process-based concept or output-based concept. And what it's done is become divorced from any sort of human value-based element or, in fact, any of just the principles of what makes better research. Um, and thus it becomes treated as distinct from, you know, whatever good sciences or better sciences, which leads to a sort of um, dichotomy within the, within the research landscape where, you know, you have people now who claim to be open scientists, and then you have people who perhaps do what we might call open science, but just don't call themselves open scientists. And it actually leads to a lot of confusion in this space. Now, this confusion makes it exceptionally easy for commercial interests to co-opt. And this is actually happening now. Or it becomes extremely easy for open science to be used as a political slogan to gain brownie points. And again, if we look in Europe at the moment, this is definitively happening. And, you know, this again goes back to the, the conflicting definitions of we don't really know what open scholarship or open science and open research are, and we haven't defined them properly at a sort of foundational level. So, you know, some people might argue that this is scholarly pedantry, but for me, I would, I would perhaps argue that the lack of precision in this space, you know, leads to corruption of it. And we've seen that, you know, in the last decade or so, particularly in the UK through, you know, how open access was designed with all the best intentions and is now being corrupted 
into something which is um, you know, now a business model and has been definitely co-opted by commercial interests. So if, if we look though at the principles of open scholarships, this is a great slide from Tony Ross Hallower. And he, he talks about these things in a very different way. He talks about openness in terms of principles such as inclusivity or transparency, accountability, equality, and public good. And as well as this, you know, one thing he doesn't discuss much are uh, like how these relate to values such as freedom and fairness, trust, justice, truth, and liberty. Something which I, I would like to think that all of us as humans sort of embody in our daily practices. And, um, you know, the way I like to think about this is that if you consider the principles, you know, these things which Tony talks about, like transparency, reproducibility and accountability, these are interlinked with the values such as equity, freedom and fairness. And they form a feedback loop with the practices, whereas if, you know, the values that you hold as a human interact with the principles that you have as you know, a good scientist, and these should inform your practices, which inherently leads you to being, you know, an open scholar. And I think this is, um, you know, definitely just something worth considering a little bit more. So something which we hear as well a lot is, you know, whether or not open science is a movement. And, you know, the fact is, I don't think it is, because the definition of a movement is a group of people working together to advance their shared political, social or artistic ideas. And this is important because it means that movements have a direction and they have shared goals and they're defined by commonality, typically in terms of the principles or values. But, you know, I don't think we have designed or defined these yet for open science. We haven't defined a governance structure for who's leading the movement. We haven't defined sort of what the boundaries of it are or what happens if you're outside of it. And we also haven't really self-reflected enough, you know, as a community um, as to what happens when we can't actually answer these questions. Um, and this, again, this leads to this problem of, you know, if, if the research community is not trying to define what these things are, then it leads to, um, you know, an imbalance in the power at play. So I, I always like to quote the, the old Labour MP here, Tony Benn, um, you know, and he used to discuss, you know, power in a political context, but I think it's very relevant here. And he used to say that, you know, when you're thinking about these sorts of systems, you have to ask the five powerful questions. You say, what power have you got? Where do you get it from? In whose interest do you exercise it? To whom are you accountable? And finally, how can we get rid of you? And you know, these are sort of democratic rights in which we get to ask these questions. And if you apply them to the present system, then you end up going down some pretty interesting sort of rabbit holes. And one of the things I believe which we need to ask more of here is, you know, are, are the big commercial publishers actually helping or hindering this, us in this space? You know, because they are exercising an extreme amount of power over the um, over the entire sort of research life cycle at the moment, but you know these are organisations who um, who are very much stuck in a pre digital mindset, and you know their primary product, journals and papers, was developed in the seventeenth century, and in fact it was the business practices of companies like Springer and Elsevier and Wiley who catalyzed the open science uh, community or movement against them, and this was because you know, there was an uprising against their business models, which were often leading to things like bias on, and exclusivity, exploitation of privilege. And, you know, um, they were most definitely putting things like um, private profits over, you know, the fact that knowledge was supposed to be a good for the people. And what's happened is now, if you look at like the Elsevier and Springer Nature websites, they say that they do things like you know, Elsevier partners with the research community to empower open science. So they are definitely sort of paying lip service to open science while simultaneously subverting it to meet their their own goals and it's disgusting and you know frankly whenever i look at this sort of thing and see you know now if you look on the you know european commission uh, lobbying registry it says that elsevier uh, lobbies on behalf of the open science community and it's like what the bloody hell are they talking about you know they do not share the same values and principles that we do and that's obvious for anyone who, uh, who takes just a, a cursory look at how they operate. And the same is for other companies too, like, you know, Springer Nature. Recently, they, um, they try to go public. And if you look at their, their IPO prospectus, they have the, so much interesting stuff in there, which gives a really interesting insight into, uh, into the business practices and how they view the scholarly publishing landscape. And, you know, one, one uh, quote which sticks out for me again is that they stated, we also aim at increasing APCs by increasing the value we offer to authors through improving the impact factor and reputation of our existing journals. And you know, these, this statement 
is essentially against everything which the open science uh, community stands for. You know, we don't want increasing APCs. We don't want the impact factor to be conflated with reputation um, and all of these sorts of things. And, you know, when, when Spring and Nature were called out for this, they were like, oh, you weren't supposed to read that. That was supposed to be, <laughs> be for investors. And they took the prospectus offline. And it was just an outrageous sort of thing to do. Um, if we look again a bit wider in Europe at the moment, I don't know uh, who's aware of this, but Elsevier, again, are now going to be providing data and analytics for the future of open science in Europe through the Open Science Monitor. So 1,100 of us wrote a, um, a statement um, you know, trying to, trying to fight against this. And we called them out for it. We said, you know, Elsevier corrupting open science in Europe. You know, the fact is that a lot of Elsevier's uh, databases are incredibly biased. They're closed source. The data itself is closed. And, you know, they don't support the principles of open science. Therefore, why are they being allowed to, to essentially define the future of open science in Europe? And this is quite funny because, you know, Elsevier and the Lisbon Council, who they were working on this with, both got really, really angry. And they started making all sorts of ad hominem attacks and trying to undermine the credibility of those who were, you know, um, arguing against them. And essentially what they did was they came off like a bunch of children who weren't able to sort of argue in any sort of intellectual basis. And they made an absolute fool of themselves. And, you know, they came across as, in, as if like, you can't touch us. And it was, yeah, it was rather amusing watching, watching them fumble around in this space. Um, but we'd made a formal complaint to the European Commission about this. And yeah, we, we weren't really sure what to expect. But, you know, they, they said that they were needed to do an in-depth analysis of this because they were concerned too about, you know, the fact that Elsevier had so, sort of moved into the space and, you know, there were a lot of conflicts of interest. But ultimately, they responded. And we sort of preempted that they would find no issues with this. You know, they didn't want the European Commission themselves, you know, were investigating themselves sort of in a way. Um, as the ones who were sort of organizing all of this, but they failed to sort of adequately address a lot of um, a lot of the, the issues that we'd raised. But one outcome of this was that now the Open Science Monitor has an advisory group um, consisting of a range of sort of open science or bibliometrics experts who are now overseeing the whole process, which is, you know, a fantastic sort of um, victory, if you want, for, for the open science community. <clears throat> but what was interesting about this was, you know, while they were busy sort of dealing with this, um, at the back end, uh, myself and Bjorn Brems decided to go um, a level higher. And we submitted a formal complaint to the European Competition Authority about essentially relics uh, dominating um, unfairly and abusing a dominant position within the scholarly publishing market, as well as other issues to do with how the scholarly publishing market doesn't really function in any sort of way that allows any fair competition. And Frankly, Elsevier didn't know how to respond to this because there was no way that they could essentially try and do the same thing again after it came off so badly with the Open Science Monitor just trying to discredit us. And, you know, to date, how, how long ago was this? This was several months ago now. Um, yeah, about uh, six weeks ago now. And Elsevier haven't made a peep about it because essentially they can't. Um, and the great thing was, it wasn't just, you know, a, an uprising from two, two researchers in this case. You know, the, the European Universities Association got involved. And they submitted a formal complaint to the European Commission too, just a few days after we submitted ours, essentially outlining all of the same issues. And now the European Commission are essentially forced to hopefully do an investigation into the scholarly publishing market and start undoing um, some of this uh, skewed power bias or dynamic that we have at the moment. And you know, actually uh, provide some regulation into the scholarly publishing market to make fair competition um, a reality and to provide a little bit of um, freedom for researchers within the space, hopefully as well. I uh, don't need to go into that. But yeah, uh, you know, a, a follow up on this was that afterwards, the, um, so this is a project I worked on with um, an organization called Education International, where they represent something like 400 education unions and 30 million researchers all around the world. And they said, you know, we are a bit sick of Elsevier too, and we want, we want to harm them. Um, or you know, not harm them. So we, we want to take them on. You know, they have too much power in this space. The power is increasing. You know, what can we do? So what we're doing now with Education International is we're actually mobilizing uh, national and international unions all around the world to combat this ongoing threat, not just from Elsevier, but, you know, this wider issue of, um, of privatization of knowledge in order to increase well, sort of democratic access to this, you know, these fundamental things that humans should, uh, should have access to as a right. 
Um, and, you know, there's, there's wider changes going on as well. It's not just coming from, you know, um, researchers as well, but, you know, institutes are getting involved. So I, I love this story so much. So the chappy here is uh, Martin Kortschul. He's the president of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities. And um, in January this year, he had the opportunity to speak to a room full of several hundred of these publishers at the Academic Publishing in Europe conference. And he got up on stage and he, uh, he basically said, you know, I don't often get an opportunity to speak to you all like this. You know, I'm a member of the, uh, the negotiation consortium in Germany, which is currently negotiating with Elsevier and these, uh, these other publishers. And he said, I'm going to be really honest to you. And he went on an absolute, you know, destruction <laughs> of publishers over the next 10, 15 minutes and left the room essentially uh, shocked and into silence with, you know, this brutal honesty of how this sort of um, this gulf is forming between what research communities and institutes want and what um, publishers are able to provide. And, you know, one, one quote which sticks out is he said, you know, um, when he was in the negotiation room with uh, one big publisher, so Elsevier, that, that publisher stated, you know, if your country stops subscribing to our journals, science in your country will be set back significantly. And Martin responded, that it's interesting to hear such a threat from a producer of envelopes who does not have any idea of the contents. And this got such a sort of awkward laugh from the audience um, when they realized that essentially, you know, the things which they were providing were not what the researchers wanted or needed anymore. Um, and it was a very powerful statement to make. And, you know, I think, you know, it was, uh, you know, just very interesting and a very good reflection of, of some of the big, uh, the big challenges which we face in the future here. Um, but bringing this like closer to home to academic culture, you know, we've all heard this, this mantra of publish or perish. But, you know, I don't feel this is really appropriate anymore. I think I feel more it's like publish and perish. And this is due to, you know, this sort of underfunding, which is uh, penetrating a lot of sort of national landscapes and increasing competitiveness in climbing the academic career ladder. And, you know, this publish and or perish sort of mentality is grilled into us as soon as, as, soon as we start being a master's student or a PhD student or, or even earlier these days that you must publish in high impact journals. Um, in order to to maintain a career and that anything beyond attaining this sort of golden pinnacle of, of professorship is a failure. And then we wonder why, you know, this, this, publish or pellet, oh, this publish or perish mentality exists. And we seem to also at the same time have, you know, widespread um, problems with, uh, what's it, research ethics all around the world. And, you know, why mental health issues are so high that, what's it, I think this stats are something like within academic researchers, um, the prevalence of mental health issues is twice that even of the um, emergency services in the UK. And that's just, you know, it's outrageous and inexcusable, really. Um, but yeah, you know, culture change is a weird thing. So um, there's a psychological effect called the penguin effect. That's why this silly gif is appearing on screen now. And what it describes um, is a psychological effect of cultural inertia. And if you think about it, you know, in your mind. So what you, what you often have are groups of penguins and they, uh, they're standing on an iceberg, you know, um, you know, away from the sea, nice and safe. But then they, they all begin to get hungry and they need to go fishing. But they're afraid and they're afraid that there's going to be something like a, key, a killer whale or a sea lion out to sea that if they, if they go fishing, then they'll be eaten. But, um, you know, so they wait around and they huddle and they wait and they wait. Until finally, you know, one plucky penguin gets the courage to slide down the iceberg and goes fishing. And then everyone sees that the penguin was okay and is feeding and is happy. Um, and they all begin to follow, you know, slowly at first, but eventually, you know, um, all of them are, are down there. They're all swimming in the ocean and they're all fishing and they're all safe. And this is, yeah, this sort of psychological effect called the penguin effect. And what it, I think it's a beautiful analogy to, to describe how research communities function and that we are generally, you know, slowed to adapt to new technologies and practices. Um, you know, in, in my history of being in this sort of space, you know, I've heard so many bad predictions, uh, mostly from UK academics, you know, things like open access will never catch on, preprints will never be a thing, you know, sharing our data, blah, 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 all of these things, you know, what we might consider open scientific practices. And, you know, every single time the, you know, sort of old guard have, have said these sorts of things, they've been wrong. And I wonder if they ever get tired of being on the wrong side of history. Um, you know, I feel almost embarrassed for them in some cases. But if we, if we look a little bit deeper, 
you know, I think I think we all know perhaps what the drivers of open research might be. You know, we all hear things about um, increasing the reliability of the scientific record through you know increased rigor, uh, solving the reproducibility crisis, increasing public trust in research, uh, making research more efficient and collaborative. But if we consider, you know, why hasn't open research become the norm yet? Then it's often to do with this uh, this fear. So this goes back again to the cultural inertia and you know, being afraid of um, of going fishing. And, you know, all of these things, you know, fear of being different, essentially, fear of um, trying different things and and because you're not conforming to this very um, deeply embedded status quo that you might be uh, penalized in some way for it. So the message which we're often sending, um, I feel, to, to, to junior researchers in particular, is that if you want to do open, science, open scientific practices, this is divergent from your career and that there are a range of sort of social and technical barriers to overcome um, or which are creating this divergence. And a fantastic campaign was launched by uh, Corinna Logan and a few others um, in the UK about what's called Bullied into Bad Science. Um, this was, I think, just last year. But what it was, it was an initiative uh, by and for early career researchers who wanted just the very basic thing of having a fair and open and ethical research and publication environment. And it seems to me absolutely bonkers that, you know, in 2017, 2018, we need to have a campaign, <laughs> you know, for fairness and ethics in research. You know, why isn't this sort of thing uh, embedded into our culture a as a norm? And it it's bonkers. And, you know, I, I feel, again, that, you know, the more I think about this, the more it is just due to this publication um, sort of uh, culture where we're no longer sort of rewarded for doing good research, but we're rewarded for selling our research uh, to the highest bidder and for getting, you know, um, as much reputation, as much sort of prestige and as much academic capital in the form of publication points as possible. And really it's completely illogical and it, it's, it's not exactly aligned with good scientific practices. And, you know, I think that the impact factor essentially needs to be destroyed, um, you know, because good hearts law states when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. And yet we all keep sort of measuring ourselves and others by the impact factor. And it's part of this sort of wider academic system and um, culture change that we haven't figured, you know, people have been aware of these problems now for 20, 30, 40 years, and we still haven't figured out a way to change the rules of the game. And I feel again, a lot of the problem here is that researchers and all the different sort of uh, stakeholder groups or communities in this space have failed to be sort of self-reflective and hold themselves accountable for their role in this. And if you go to academic conferences or discussion groups where these things happen, uh, or, you know, sorry, where the impact factor is discussed, often everyone is very happy to point fingers at everyone else and say, you know, it's your fault, it's your responsibility to change. Um, but any sort of self-accountability seems to be shockingly absent at the present. And I think we need to spend more time looking at where the sort of pain points or the pressure points that we can um, have a really, uh, or we can look at in more detail to sort of alleviate um, this pressure that the impact factor has on, on our culture um, really needs to be done more in the future. So, but yeah, you know, ultimately this sort of cultural change that I think, you know, I think we're also sending out the wrong message in a lot of ways. And I believe that part of this is due to the fact that we're, set, we're having the wrong conversations and, you know, there seems to be a distinct lack of education in the space. So, you know, um, what we have are, um, there's a distinct divergence again between things like attitudes versus practice in this space. So the quotes here are taken from a uh, article from last year, which looks at the uh, rates of open access in the global, global health research. So, you know, arguably one of the most um, important sort of research fields because it has an impact on promoting things like health equity and saving people's lives. What this study found was that three out of five researchers don't self-archive their work, even when it's free and in keeping with the journal policy. So these researchers are not making their research publicly accessible, even though it's absolutely not a risk to them. And it seems bizarre that you would do that in a field where making your research publicly accessible can have such a high public impact. Um, and again, you know, I feel a lot of this isn't due to researchers not wanting these things, but simply perhaps not being aware of the options to them. So, you know, if you speak to a lot of researchers these days, they will still say open access is too expensive. But this view is due to what we call, um, uh, uh, sorry, to a large part, to what we might call FUD, 
from uh, scholarly publishers, and FUD stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt. And they promote this a lot. You know, they say things like, you know, you have to pay $3,000 in order to make your work open access. Well, you know, this sort of thing is just rubbish. If you look at the directory of open access journals, which indexes only open access journals, about 70% of them, which is about uh, seven or 8,000 of these journals, do not charge any APCs. And, you know, in, in the UK in particular, we now have a lot of sort of institutional memberships and publishing funds and support from our funders to, to pay these APCs. So even if open access is too expensive, a lot of the times it's not. And where it is, we can actually just get um, either fee waivers or we can get institutes to pay for that. And, you know, all around the world, you know, there are a lot of sort of inequities around this space. But ultimately, at the end of the day, this, this bottom one here, where self-archiving openly costs nothing, is the most important because that really is some which levels the playing field in the space. Um, and if you look at sort of like all of the research which has ever looked at uh, a comparison between open openness and closedness, I just just made them on the spot. Um, what they've found is that no matter sort of if you agree or not with the present evaluation system or um, or not, um, if you look at things like citation counts, which are inherently that are important in these spaces, then open practices help. So, you know, the open access citation advantage is incredibly common where publishing open access tends to lead to a significant increase in the number of citations that you achieve. As well as that, things like sharing preprints can lead to uh, not just rapid communication, greater exposure, but you also lead to ultimately more citations, which you begin to accumulate earlier and at a faster rate. And if you're an early career researcher, then this sort of thing should be really useful for um, for your career prospects. And the same is uh, also true for things like sharing data and sharing code, where a lot of research into this has shown that, you know, if you share your research more openly, then you get more citations, you get more media attention, you get more attention sort of from policymakers, um, and you ultimately get like more exposure, which is good for you and your career as a sort of side effect of just, you know, um, abiding by these basic principles of allowing other people to to reuse your work. And there's a fantastic research paper out there by Aaron McKinn and, and colleagues called um, How Open Science Helps Researchers Succeed. And I strongly recommend reading this because, you know, what it tells us is that openness, no matter which system we, we're playing by, you know, the old one or, you know, any sort of new one, in this rapidly changing space, openness is inherently good. But it also conveys to me a, a key message that, you know, as, as early career researchers, we really should be in a position where we're able to influence our academic system and not be stifled by the current actors in it. And by the current actors, um, you know, I generally mean those who are holding on to tra tradition or the status quo, such as, you know, for example, hiring and tenure committees and some of the larger publishers. And there was a great quote from Tim Berners-Lee recently, and he was talking about essentially revolutionizing the whole web. And he said, you know, we're not talking to Facebook and to Google about whether or not to introduce a complete change where all of their business models are completely upended overnight. We're not asking their permission. And it seems that we should take this sort of, to me, that we should take this strong stance when we're uh, talking about the future of publishing and of uh, research evaluation. Why are we asking permission from, from these private corporations about you know, what we're allowed to do? And you know, I think this sort of um, stance is needed when we're talking about things like Plan S in the future as well. Um, I'm gonna skip this a little bit because I think I'm running out of time. Um, but yeah, anyway, like the point is the message we should be communicating is that openness is inherently good for ourselves, it's good for our careers, it's good for our research, and it's good for the public too. And you know, on a on sort of pragmatic and practical level, you know, there is substantial evidence out there that shows that open scientific practices increase the dissemination of your research, they increase your personal profile, they allow you to emphasize your core values, they increase the effectiveness of your research, and they give you more control as well over, over what you're doing and, and the future of your work. So instead of this, this message that we seem to be perpetuating that you know, um, if you do open science, it's going to harm your career, in fact, you know, the, the message which we should be sending out, which I feel is much more aligned with reality, is that open scientific practices actually are perfectly aligned with advancing your career. And, but we seem to be having this, this gulf uh, where education is the problem. We're not sending this message out uh, as much as we need, and we're not also training people enough in open scientific practice, practice as well as what the principles and values supporting this might be. So, you know, just to sort of 
tie this all together. You know, what can we all achieve if we stand together as a global research community? And you know, I invite publishers and and other co companies to be part of like this this wider ecosystem. But we have to make sure that we act as a unified global community, and to ensure that we're acting in the best interest of the wider public and and not corporate gains. Um, and you know, culture change is not something which is which is uh, easy. Um, but you know, at a at a fundamental level, we do need more education, training, and support. I feel in this space, and this is where something I'm working on with the Open Science MOOC comes in. This is supposed to be a peer-to-peer -peer community space where uh, researchers can train themselves, and we're based on good tools and services and values to to promote op open scientific practice and principles um, across the world. And you know, prove us what we hope to achieve is empowerment and leadership for the next generation. You know, those who are going to be taking over. The academies uh, in the next decade or so and through this you know shift these power dynamics which which we talked about to reduce sort of bias and abuse within the academy um, and you know build a global community that's based on strong values sharing and collaboration so yeah you know our, our vision of the future at the open science MOOC is to help make open the default setting for all global research and like i said you know this is based on building a community based around tools and teachers and role models but also underpinned by strong values based on freedom and equitable access to research. And, you know, honestly, the, you know, I think the, the time for this is really good because we have new expectations now as researchers. You know, we all believe that transparency is often better than secrecy, uh, except in exceptional circumstances. We know that collaboration and working in an interdisciplinary manner is much more effective than going solo. And, you know, we have this thing called the web now. Where we're able to work uh, much more uh, you know, uh, the flow dynamic has changed where no longer do we have to just produce sort of discrete outputs as research papers, but the research process and the communication of it can become much more continuous. And so what we're working on is um, creating sustained community engagement across disciplines and across silos, um, as well as potentially in the future being active more politically and at a community level. And, you know, two of the big goals that we have are sort of retooling and rethinking our mindset from being academics to being scientists and ultimately changing this incentive system that seems to be controlling much of what we do. Um, so just a bit, a bit about the MOOC, you know, everything which we're building is open for reuse. Um, everything CC0 or CC BY, you know, all the audio, all the tasks, all the um, visual content that we're creating is open. And we're making it in as many sort of formats as possible, including um, you know, in uh, Jupyter Notebook format, in PDF, HTML. So, you know, anyone can re reuse any of this content for whatever purposes they see fit for training, uh, either personally in workshops, um, even just giving small webinars about this sort of thing. And we launched, uh, we did a soft launch last week on an open source platform called Eliademy. And, you know, I welcome anyone, anyone who's listening to this to come and join us. Um, it's great. People are already completing a lot of the tasks and saying how, how cool it is that they're learning these new skills and gaining this new knowledge. Um, and yeah, we, we're very much open to anyone who wants to who wants to be part of this. Um, and, you know, imagine a future now defined by these values and these principles of open scholarship where, you know, knowledge becomes a freely available public good. And at its core, it's rigorous and reproducible. Um, but really, you know, what we, the, the message which we want to communicate goes back to what Mick was saying. You know, isn't this just good science? You know, openness in all of its sort of forms and definitions leads to just a better understanding and practice of, of science. Um, what, what time is it? Yeah, okay, we've got, we got a few minutes more, so I'll keep going. I hope that's okay, Al. Yeah, you got time. Um, okay, cool. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, um, if you look at the current state of scholarly communication, and a lot of aspects, it's a little bit embarrassing. You know, we have a 19th century process of peer review applied to a 17th century communication format around journals. And the fact that we still call, you know, the primary output of research papers, you know, a, a hangover from the analog age is a little bit embarrassing. And the web technologies that we have are so far behind any other sort of industry at the moment. You know, there are a lot, there are a lot of really, really great innovators in this space, you know, Fixture being one of them, you know, the open science framework, all of the uh, code ocean, but you know, the primary sort of uh, core of our communication process is still adapting to like technologies, which we had in 1995. And honestly, we can do better. Um, you know, because if you look at almost every other industry in the world at the moment, we are leveraging the power of the web and networks 
to, to do evaluation and communication in a much better way. You know, think of uh, just platforms like Amazon or TripAdvisor. One of the first things that you do is you go and look at how other people have evaluated a certain product or, or um, you know, just anything really. And it's an incredibly powerful way of doing things. And it seems to me completely nuts that we're not leveraging the power of people and of web technologies to, uh, to evaluate and communicate scientific results these days. Um, so just, you know, hypothetically speaking, like just it's a really fun thing to sort of explore in your mind. Imagine sort of what a future platform would look like if you were to rebuild scholarly communication in 2018. You know, you'd have to have things like quality control and moderation, so typically done through an editorially controlled peer review process as part of this. You'd have to have certification and reputation in built into this. Again, something typically um, ascribed through um, journal level metrics and, you know, things like the impact factor. And you'd have to have engagement incentives, which is, you know, something which is inherent to us. But if you think about peer review and the evaluation process, both of these are undergoing sort of rapid transformations at the moment, or at least are being very heavily criticized in, in um, being, you know, uh, not sort of achieving the standards which we, which we hold them to. And, you know, I, I feel that if you really think about how these three sort of um, core aspects can be harmonized together, then we can think about creating something like a decentralized infrastructure where openness is embedded at a sort of practical level. And, you know, again, if you want to just sort of think about this in, in your mind, imagine what something would look like if we combined the, combined the elements of Stack Exchange with something like uh, Wikipedia for moderation with GitHub for version control, you know, and we have this sort of open communication process where, you know, it was a continuous, uh, rigorous community operated um, sort of uh, flow. You know, inherently, it would be open source and low cost. Inherently, we'd be able to evaluate things at a much more sort of granular level. Collaboration, you know, would become an intrinsic part of this. Um, but importantly, you know, it would be community owned. So it would be beyond a sort of um, uh, control of, of commercial entities. And what we could do is actually begin to decouple uh, the review process and the communication process from those who are exercising perhaps or we might say too much control over this process at the moment and return power of these processes to community to scholarly communities and to and to the public and this is this is important because this is i think what one of the fundamental goals of the open scholarship movement should be um and you know there are a lot of sort of promising initiatives sort of in this space at the moment so for example the open scholarship initiative as a um, cross-stakeholder sort of engagement forum uh, there are a lot of cross-national initiatives, such as, you know, uh, Plan S now, there's Cielo in Latin America, there's Open Air in Europe, there's DOHA all around the world. Um, and there's also now this, this joint roadmap for open science tools, which, although very uh, new, is all about bringing together, um, you know, different tools and services within the sort of open scholarship space and connecting them together to improve research workflows and create the sort of open scholarship, open scholarship infrastructure. And, you know, there's, there's other things I'm working on, such as like the MOOC and this open scholarship strategy. And what this is all about is um, bringing different communities and different people and different pieces of knowledge from all around the world. And, you know, just bringing things together and providing some sort of cohesion behind the open scholarship space. And I think if we do this really carefully, what we might be able to do is create something like an open science coalition or an open scholarship coalition which is akin to something like the Free Software Foundation or the Open Source Initiative, which were transformative moments in the evolution of uh, software development. And if we, uh, if we actually come together to create something like this, you know, we can build up on sort of three layers. And the first of these would be something like community engagement, training and education. So something which, for example, the Figshare ambassadors could be an intrinsic part of. The second would be uh, tool services and infrastructure, um, which would be developed um, through things like the Joint Roadmap for Open Science Tools. And the third would be political and public activism. And at the moment, this is something, uh, a sort of layer of this, which is almost completely missing within the uh, open scholarship space. We, we aren't being active enough um, in either communicating, you know, what it is which we're all about to either people or to policymakers or to politicians. And this is something which, uh, you know, I think that we all need to be 
um, much more aware of in the future as, as openness continues um, to evolve in the next few years. But you know, ultimately, you know, I'm going to steal this quote from uh, Brian Nosek and Chris Chambers. You know, they said um, future generations will look back on the term open science as a tautology, a throwback from an era before science woke up, and open science will simply become known as science. And the closed secretive practices that define our current culture will seem as primitive to them as alchemy is to us. Um, and I think this is just such a powerful way of, of, of looking at it, because again, it goes back to the sentiment that open science really is just good science. And, you know, my, my intention with the, the open science MOOC is that maybe in five years time, then we won't be needed anymore because open science will have become the norm and we can just stop using the term open science because we'll just call it science. Um, and the ultimate goal through this, again, is to create this sort of this community, this platform, this network, I don't really know how to describe it much, but you know, to, it's a goal where we, we are pool, pooling knowledge and resources within the sort of wider scholar ecosystem to create a decentralized infrastructure, but with communities and values and principles as the focus. And from this, you know, the practices will become inherent to us and research will be better. Um, and we can base it on these these really human elements that you know I'd like to think that we all stood for, such as you know inclu inclusivity, equality, accountability, freedom, fairness, and you know ultimately the 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 final 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 goal will be to create this. Well, my vision is that science will return to being a public good for the betterment of society rather than something which is controlled by by private companies. Um, so thank you all for listening to my my rant. And I would be happy to answer any questions that might have transpired during this time. Take it away, Al. Thank you very much, John. There was a lot there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think what I like uh, about your talks and how I've seen it develop over time is it's, um, it's not just ranting. It's actually, you know, talking about how we're going to solve the problem in quite pragmatic and realistic ways, which I think uh, this, this, uh, it's not a movement, can't call it a movement, this, uh, the open science needs. So, um, uh, does anybody have any questions? Doesn't look like they do. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, actually, there is. Uh, oh, we have one from Mark. Yeah, just, yeah, just come on <laughs> in. Uh, okay. <laughs> how, cheap, <laughs> how cheap do you think we could get APCs? From that is a really good question. So, for those who don't know, an APC is an article processing charge that some publishers levy in order to, um, to uh, I guess, p cover the costs of publishing open access. And I think at the moment, I have absolutely no goddamn idea about this. And this is an, a really big problem with the way in which the current sort of system works, because we actually have no idea from the vast majority of publishers about how much production costs. So, you know, we know that Elsevier and Wiley and TNF, all these big uh, publishers, they will charge between, you know, 2,000, 3,000 euros for the production of an article. But we don't actually know what that's going on. We know it's a combination of direct and indirect costs. So the actual cost of production and the cost of maintaining the business. And if we look at other companies that are like Ubiquity Press, then their costs are transparent. And in the region, about 20 to 30 percent of these, they, I think, the APC with Ubiquiti Press is something like 450 euros. And the reason why they, or one of the things which relates to this, why it's so low, is that they're really transparent with their costs. They, they say, this is exactly where the money is going to. This bit goes towards production. This one goes towards you know, uh, infrastructure maintenance. This one goes towards advertising. And this is the sum of that is what our article processing charges are. So in terms of how cheap do I think we can get them, I think it really depends on whether or not we allow publishers to continue being extremely opaque with the real cost of publishing. Um, because we know from some ridiculously efficient journals, such as like the Journal of Machine Learning Research, that the cost of producing an article with them is something like $1.50, and it produces what is inherently exactly the same as what we charge 100 times that, that uh, price for. Um, so it depends on how much transparency we can get into the system and whether or not we actually use that transparency to drive down prices within a fair and equitable market. And that seems like it's a long way away to me at the moment. Cool, thank you. Uh, any other questions? 
if not, I just want to say uh, thanks again to John. Um, it was an amazing talk. Um, and as I said, there, there was a lot there. So we're going to be um, sending around this recording. Uh, we do have one more question that's just come in. Uh, do you have any faith in a UK scholarly comms license as a route toward open, open science? Yes, I do. Um, so I think, yeah, for those who, um, who, again, might not be aware of what this is, I think the UK scholarly communications license is equivalent to the Harvard license of open access in that um, it essentially prevents copyright from being transferred to a third party and it must be retained by either the researcher or the research institute. Um, and I think copyright, again, is one of these sort of giant dragons that we have to slay um, in the future of whatever openness looks like. Um, yes, I have a lot of faith. I, I think the people who have um, been uh, promoting it are very intelligent and they know what they're doing in this space. They understand it very well. Um, I would love to see the UK Skullcoms license be taken up by those beyond you know, the UK as well in particular. Um, as a way of sort of returning control and rights to, to those who deserve it. Cool, uh, another question has come in. Uh, what do you think will be the effect of a business model built on APC on quality of content? Is there uh, a risk that OA publishers will lower the quality to publish at all costs? Whew. That's a really interesting question and I wish I had more time to think about it. Um, I think, first of all, like it's really difficult to define quality in this space. And I, I feel like quality is often used as like a sort of red herring um, to, to sort of throw off conversations from intrinsic value or efficiency. You know, a lot of people talk about quality as some sort of intrinsic property of the research that's immeasurable, yet um, always assumed to be a fundamental property of it. But, you know, if quality is something that we define as like, you know, is, is the research still, you know, um, part of, is it still widely discussed in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years time, then that has absolutely nothing really to do with um, how much we charge or the cost of production for communicating that knowledge. Um, is there a risk that open access publishers will lower the quality to publish at all costs? I don't think so, because publishers have absolutely nothing to do with quality. You know, the quality, again, is intrinsic to the research itself, and that depends on the researchers and the future of, of, of research in related disciplines. Um, I don't think that publishers have any sort of control on this. Um, you know, the thing which we often sort of, uh, I say we get wrong in this space is that quality is a stamp which journals or publishers apply to research, whereas in fact it's more the other way around, where um, the quality of a journal or, or the value of a journal, um, you know, often often conflated, are uh, are actually granted by the research in which it publishes, which the researchers grant. Um, so uh, it's a really tricky question, and I would need to think about it a little bit more. But yeah. Oh, I just had another question come in. Um, what do you think of Plan S? I don't want to comment on that. <laughs> 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 no, really, like it's so complicated at the moment um, and it's a really hot topic. I think it's great that, you know, you know, we've been in this space now for what, seven or eight years. And one of the things that we've always struggled as, I guess, open supporters is getting more researchers engaged in the conversation. And now all of a sudden Planus comes along and it's inspired a lot more people um, to get involved in conversations. And I think ultimately that's a good thing. Um, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to talk about the potential impact it can have, though, because yeah, it's it's complicated. Hashtag it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> and on that note, uh, I just want to say uh, thanks again to John. Um, if anyone has any any questions for him, he's uh, Proto Hedgehog on Twitter. <laughs> and, uh, would uh, glad gladly uh, answer you any more questions or uh, ping them through to uh, info at figshare.com. But thanks again for coming and thanks again to John. Yep, yeah, and thank you all. Thanks, Al, and thanks all for listening. Ciao. Cheers. Bye-bye.